or we're just going through the day, we are asking $25. This helps us get by. And uh, Mike Nurko is his name. He'll be here soon, probably sitting in the back of the room, so you can see him if you hadn't already registered fully. Uh, we got a full schedule today. Unfortunately, Ronnie Duggar, who I've been trying for the last five years to get to come to this conference, and then he agrees and then changes his mind at the last minute, the editor of the Texas Observer. Uh, <coughs> but I'm, I'm hoping that he uh, he's going to join us. But um, as it turns out, I can't, in the last three days, I haven't gotten a phone call. I hope nothing's wrong, but we were going to bring him in remote, but he couldn't do it. And then I uh, asked Ed Tatro uh, if he could do the first session here. So, um, and then uh, between now and noon, we're going to have Lisa Pease and Jim Diogenio, Pat Spear, and at 11, Dr. Wecht. And then after Wecht comes in remotely, we're going to break for lunch. So, um, and we're going at a fairly good clip. Um, and uh, Ed Tatro, for them as don't know him, uh, is a researcher who uh, he was regaling us yesterday with stories about how you know, when he was a fairly young person, he was he was down at the Garrison trial, and he <laughs> he knew Sylvia Marr, and so uh, you know he I, I'm like a 1.5 generation researcher. He seems to be about a 1.2. <laughs> <laughs> I think I was the youngest of the first generation. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, he was right in there on the ground floor, and has been working hard since, and uh, you know has uh, he read us a chapter of his book last year, and. Uh, so I just asked him if he, he'd add some comments today. So I don't even know for sure what he's talking about, but that makes two of us. No. <laughs> and he uh, he d he doesn't have a book out yet, so obviously he's not a real person. But um, <laughs> but he's probably got more books inside of him than most of us have outside of us. So uh, uh, if you have any questions about the Kennedy assassination, he could probably answer them. Uh, he told me he did a slideshow in the past that was 3,000 slides. I don't know, you know, I think they, that was one where, like my lectures, you know, the, I, we don't charge to come in, but we charge to get out. So, <laughs> so this, is, this is Ed Tatro. Thank you for doing it, Ed. Nobody <laughs> Well, I don't have time for it because we're, we're just uh, Can I just add one comment then? It'll take just a few seconds. The Bobby Baker expose was going to be in Life in 1964. And do you know who was the source for Life magazine for that story? I know the primary source. Robert Kennedy. Oh, I know that. Yeah. But I, I know the primary source. He wanted source. to dump Johnson so he'd be off the ticket in 64. I've known for 20 years about this. Yeah. I saw that email by Doug Horn. Explosive new information. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. No, no dog. <laughs> you got to go back to the old boys who got with people. You know. I knew I knew people who worked at the Hotel Del Chao from Murchison to the 50. I, I know who was they were talking to to write that article. Okay, and I have all that documentation. <laughs> was the article spiked? Excuse me? Was the article spiked? Did, did it come it out? It never came out. And, and, and apparently it's been destroyed. Mm -hmm. Every, everything they were going to say about Johnson and Hoover, but that life was going to do was gone. So, but that's. It just, that's the first, I think, time it's come out in the public, but I've known about it for 20 years. Mm -hmm. Anyway, is that it? We have this pretty short for him. I do. Yeah. He, he did better than you. <laughs> How do we turn this back Thanks. on? Thanks. Well, you get, just got more in 15 minutes than you probably get for a couple hours from some people, so. Uh, thank you for doing that, Ed. And uh, now we have Lisa Pease, and she has a presentation here. I don't know. We can maybe close some blinds so we can see it a little better. But uh, Lisa, for those who don't, don't know her, um, was one of the founding members of uh, the Citizens uh, Truth About the Kennedy Assassination in Los Angeles, which was one of the founding groups of COPA. And uh, oh, all right. And. Uh, the um, she was a co-editor of Probe magazine, and then many of the Probe articles were uh, condensed into a, a book later called The Assassinations. And um, she worked with Jim Diogenio, who's going to speak after her. That's all right. I think Chris is showing you the book. Uh, <laughs> still exists. You can probably get it on Amazon, huh? Yeah. Well, they might even have some in the other room. Who knows? But. Um, Anyway, uh, so this is Lisa Pease, and she'll do the presentation, and hopefully we'll have a little time at the end for q and I'll give you some time signals. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, I'll try and rush through this.
always ask me, you know, what's your theory about the Kennedy assassination? And I've stopped answering that because it's like, I don't have a theory. I have facts. If you want to know some facts, I will share them. And uh, I'm not trying to sell anybody anything. This is what I, you know, what I know and what I believe based on what I know. So uh, I'll just give you a real simple thing. I put the little S in red here because, of course, there were two Kennedy assassinations. And it's always to my great frustration that people spend so much time on one and so little time on the Thanks. other. Because in my mind, they are completely connected. There's a reason why both were killed. So I'll give you a little bit about that today. All right, so you're going to learn really quickly how I tell people, you know, that there was a conspiracy. Because there's a couple of simple factual things. Like, there's no theory of conspiracy. There's proof of conspiracy. There are theories of who did it. And my theory of who did it is a theory. I can't prove it. All right, but I can prove conspiracy, and I will right now. <laughs> okay, here we go. All right, most of you know in the JFK case, Oswald was tested for nitrates after, you know, he was captured. They tested his hands, they tested his cheek. They found nitrates on his hand, they found no nitrates on his cheek. Well, this is a serious problem, all right, because you can't fire Oswald's rifle and not get nitrates on your cheek. It's not possible. And how do we know this? The FBI shooters tried to do this over and over and over. They even sent the weapon out to the Oak Ridge Laboratory and tried to do it there. All right, you literally cannot fire that weapon and not have nitrates on your cheeks. So there is, in this context, no such thing as a false negative. Oswald could not have fired a rifle, therefore Oswald could not have killed Kennedy. I don't care if the single bullet theory is possible or whatever. <laughs> whatever happened, Oswald didn't do it provably by the scientific evidence. All right, and you say, but wait, Bugliosi said, you can get a false negative, right? FBI Special Agent Cortland Cunningham, he told the Warren Commission how to do it. Well, if you actually read what Cortland Cunningham said, it's very interesting. So, you know, I thought I'd bring it here for you. He's talking about how he went with another man to figure out how to do this. And he goes, well, we cleaned off the rifle. I loaded it for him. He held it in one of the cleaned areas, and I pushed the clip in so he would not have to get his hands near the chamber. In other words, so he wouldn't pick up residues from it or from the action or from the receiver. And then when we ran the cast, we got no reaction on either hand or cheek. Now, I'm thinking, I'm going, you know, <laughs> if Oswald is standing there and somebody else is holding the clip, doesn't that make two people, and isn't that a conspiracy? <laughs> <laughs> so we have, even by the FBI and the Warren Commission's own testimony, proof of conspiracy <laughs> in the Kennedy assassination. <laughs> and of course, some of the people on the Warren Commission are a little smarter than others, like Norman Redlick, and he wrote to Alan Dulce, because, you know, at best, the analysis shows Oswald may have fired a pistol, because he did have nitrates on his hand. He said, although this is by no means certain, and that's because you can get nitrates from a book or from cardboard, the very things Oswald handled all day. All right, but Norman Redlick also said there is no basis for concluding that he also fired a rifle. That's right there in the Warren Commission's own records. So done. All right, let's talk about the RFK case. All right, now, provably, RFK was hit four times. We know this for a fact. There were two bullets recovered from him. We know this for a fact. Five other people wounded, five bullets recovered from each of those people. They all lived, but they all had bullets removed from them. So we're up to seven bullets. All right, there were at least three holes in the ceiling, three that we know of for sure, it, it appears there were more, but three that we know of for sure. Um, so the uh, LAPD says, well, one bullet went into the ceiling, hit something there, bounced back out, but, you know, since there's an odd number, one had to go up and stay there. So that's your eight bullets, right? Okay, well, we have a serious problem because there are four <laughs> more bullet holes <laughs> in the pantry, provably thanks to the FBI who actually did their job and did a very good job. All right, and I'm going to show you pictures of these, but I want to orient you before I show the pictures. Because I used to see these pictures out of context, and I could never figure out which picture is that, where are those bullet holes. So I'm going to show you right here with this little drawing. These are the pantry doors that Kennedy walked through. He came right through these from the stage into the pantry. All right, two bullets were found almost horizontally on the left, two in the middle almost vertically. I'll show you the pictures of these first. All right, notice these are called E1 and E2. That's what the FBI labeled these when they labeled them as bullet holes in the report. <laughs> All right, two on the left and a blow up of the two on the left. All right, and then here are the ones in the center, two in the center, a blow up of the ones in the center. All right, now people have tried to explain this away, you know, and they said, oh, well, these holes were made by carts in the kitchen. You know, they were pushing these carts, and they just pushed them into the, the door, and that's how these holes got made. Well, you tell me how a horizontal cart, you know, makes vertical <laughs> 
poles. I would like to see that cart. That would be a very unusual cart. I've never seen such a thing in my life. Um, other explanations, well, Vincent DiPiero and his friends used to poke around. They're the ones who made the holes. And so I interviewed Vincent DiPiero and I said, you know, did you make holes? And Patrick goes, oh yeah, my friend and I, we used to chip away with our pencil. I said, well, did you make these holes? <laughs> and I showed him both sets of photos. He goes, oh no, we didn't make any of those holes. <laughs> He goes, there was a big hole we made. No, those aren't the holes we made. So, all right, those excuses are gone. Now, the FBI knew, this, I mean, the LAPD knew this was a serious problem. So the first thing they did is they burned the evidence. <laughs> they, they got rid of the door frame so that no one could look at them again. The next thing they did is very interesting. They wrote a very interesting letter to the FBI, and they said, you know, if you had called those possible bullet holes or probable bullet holes, that would have been okay. But since you called them unequivocally bullet holes, if that's your stance, we should be looking for a second shooter. I mean, the LAPD was very clear that that was the case. And so in the letter, they're practically begging the LAPD to retract the identification. But the FBI never issued such a retraction. So again, proof. Uh, the, the Sirhan gun, whether Sirhan fired it or not, the only gun in evidence can only hold eight bullets. All right, so you can't account for 12 with one shooter. There had to be at least two shooters. So that's our baseline, conspiracy in both cases. All right, let's look at some clues. And again, I have very little time, and there's, you know, as you know, mountains and worlds of evidence, and I'm just going to pick a couple little things that I find very interesting to share with you. Uh, we heard last night uh, President John F. Kennedy in his American University speech basically state American policy. The United States, as the world knows, will never start a war. All right, but what happened after the Kennedys were assassinated? Well, we got to the Bush Doctrine of preemptive war. And it's not a minor change. This is huge. The first time as a nation we accept as our policy that we start the wars. That's what Ron Paul said in the presidential debate. And it is. It's, it's true. We have come 180 degrees from where we started. And I believe that was the end goal of the Kennedy assassination, was to get us to this point where America was willing to start wars. Because, whoops, I'm sorry, there are people who want to create an American empire. All right, and we gave them the power in 1947, all right, or actually 1941, if you want to go back that far. When we created the OSS, we gave the establishment its own private army, and we gave them funds, and we gave them complete unaccountability. All right, that was our, the original sin in my mind of this country, is that we actually gave the establishment the power to make policy without going through the democratic <coughs> process. All right. And the Cold War was never really about communism. That was the excuse for the Cold War. That was not the reason for the Cold War. The Cold War was all about resource control. And it took me a long time to realize that in reading over and over. But if you look at every single conflict that happened, you know, every leader that was deposed, it was always about some key resource. And it's not always oil. A lot of people go, oh, oil, oil, oil. There are many resources around the world. The Congo is an area that has what they call rare earth minerals that aren't found anywhere else on the planet. That's why the poor Congo is always at war, because there are all these people who need those resources. They have a mineral you use <coughs> in the making of jet engines that you can't get anywhere else on the planet. We wouldn't have a jet engine industry if we didn't have a foothold in the Congo. So that's what the Cold War was about. And we used then anti-communism as our excuse to go about and build an American empire where we had footholds in all these resource areas. Both the Kennedys realized this and opposed that. They said, we have to be able to deal with these people. It's their land. It's their resources. We should buy and trade and sell. We shouldn't just go in and rob. That was not their policy. All right. So what does the CIA do to people who stand in the way of those who oppose the goals of American empire? Well. We have a lot of examples. <laughs> they depose you, all right? They install dictators. They'll kill you or they'll try to kill you. All right, as John Perkins, who wrote an interesting book called uh, Confessions of an Economic Hitman, put it, he said, we send in the jackals. He goes, you know, first we try and get what we want. If that doesn't work, then we try and threaten. And if that doesn't work, well, we try and create some sort of an economic leverage system. We loan them money we know they can't repay, and then we ex <coughs> you know, extract the resources in return. If that doesn't work, we send in the jackals. And if that doesn't work, then we send in the military. And that's exactly what happened in Iraq, if you follow the pattern. Because we did try and kill Saddam several times, <laughs> and we failed. In fact, Gordon Novell, you know, thought he was part of one of those plots at one point. That's another story. But uh, <laughs> um, that's a very funny story, too. <laughs> Anything from Gordon is a funny story. All right, but this is serious business. And any person, be they American or not, who stands in the way of empire has this sort of treatment. All right, so. We come to November of 1963, and I love this episode because I think it is just absolutely telling. All right, on November 9th, early in the month, all right, the New York Times reported that a weapons cache was found in Venezuela. 
All right, and supposedly these weapons had been put there by the Cubans. And what that meant is that Castro was now exporting his revolution in violation of his agreement with Kennedy after the Cuban Missile Crisis. All right, so what does Kennedy do? Here is, you know, Castro putting weapons in, in Venezuela. Well, he does nothing, all right, because Kennedy knows better. He knows this is not Castro's doing. All right, so two weeks go by and nothing happens. So Richard Helms over at CIA is getting a little nervous. He's like, here's our big chance to go into, you know, Cuba and get Castro. What's the holdup? So Helms decides he's going to go to the White House and personally persuade the president and his brother that we need to go act against Castro. All right, and what this tells me is, again, since two weeks had gone by since the initial report, clearly <laughs> the Kennedys weren't concerned. They didn't buy the, the story that it was from Cuba. Second of all, this puts a complete lie to the Lamar Waldron and Thomas Hartman books that say that Kennedy was planning an invasion of Cuba. If Kennedy was planning an invasion of Cuba, here was his green light. All he had to say was, heck yeah, let's go, let's make this, you know, this is our big moment, you know. And Kennedy did nothing because he had no plans to invade Cuba. He intended to keep his promise to Castro. All right, so Helms goes to, he goes to RFK first because RFK is in charge of all things Cuba related. And he takes him a Belgian sub submachine gun that has no serial numbers. They've all been filed off, all right, from the cache. All right. And Helms said, well, the Cubans removed the serial numbers so the weapons couldn't be traced to Cuba. Hmm, that's so convenient. <laughs> All right. Ah, but I love this even better. Now, and by the way, this is in Helms' autobiography, and I'll talk about the significance <coughs> of that in a minute. But I just, I love this story. Helms said, well, a CIA man devised a chemical that it would allow the markings, the serial markings, to reappear <laughs> briefly, but only once, and then disappear forever, and the chemical would only work one time. <laughs> and then he writes in a, in a so Helmsian way, a complex bit of photography solved the problem, to which I say, yeah, right. <laughs> I think it's called photo alteration. <laughs> All right, so RFK, doing his due diligence, says, well, we should at least talk to my brother, right? So he calls JFK, and they, he and Helms go over to the White House. Helms walks into the Oval Office carrying a Belgian submachine gun. Can you imagine the implied threat? You know, here's the head of the CIA, the head of the black ops part of the CIA, the du deputy director of plans, walking into Kennedy's office. The threat is, I can get to you at any time. Now, I don't know what Obama would have done, but I sure as hell know what a lot of our presidents would have done. You know, <laughs> they would have said, you can have whatever you want. <laughs> but Kennedy didn't. Kennedy was not afraid. He wasn't afraid of Helms with a submachine gun in his face. He wasn't afraid of anything. He'd already faced death several times in his life. And he's like, you know, I have some questions for you. He said, how did the Cubans get three tons of ordnance on the beach? And Helms says, well, in the process of getting smartly away from the scene of the crime, the Cubans had overlooked one of their outboard-powered launches. It had been left where they beached it, 200 yards from the weapons cache. So we're to believe that the Cubans went to all that trouble to remove, you know, those serial markings so that they only showed up chemically once, but they didn't bother to account for the missing boat? Oh, come on. Come on. Yeah, right. All right, so meanwhile, down in Venezuela, we get a different perspective because there's a CIA guy there who wrote a book about, you know, his experiences there, and he has a little episode, you know, chapter on this episode, and he goes, you know, there were these arms found. They were from Belgium. We asked the Belgian government to try and find out when, not if, when the Cubans had purchased the weapons. All right, well, that's interesting because didn't we just help the Belgians in the Congo? Didn't we help, like, get Lumumba removed so the Belgians could get access to the Katanga province? Don't the Belgians kind of owe us something? Is this maybe calling in our chit? All right, and then the boat that had been left behind by the, the Canadian, it had been sold by a Canadian firm to the Cuban Agrarian Reform Institute. And Smith writes, he goes, you know, I like the touch about the boat being sold by the Canadians. Makes it sound as though Castro is trying to be real spooky, using cover like the Agrarian Reform Institute to deliver arms. But again, if, if, you know, if Castro was doing it, wouldn't it have been the American Agrarian Reform Institute buying the boat? Why would it be the Cuban Agrarian Reform Institute if he's trying to do a front? The other thing is, uh, there were maps found that supposedly showed how the weapons were going to get to the city and how they were going to be used to overthrow the Venezuelan government, you know. Uh, a Venezuelan leftist who was in the custody of the police in Venezuela had maps that he said were related to the weapons cache. Well, isn't that proof? Well, Smith goes, you know, aren't those the maps we found a year ago <laughs> before the cache ever showed up? And, uh, and a Ven Venezuelan desk officer had gotten them out and said, oh yeah, those are those same maps. I sent them over to the Venezuelan police, and they showed them to the guy, and, he s and sure enough, the guy confessed and said, yes, those are the maps, you know, for our revolution. And Smith said, you know, he probably confessed after his head had been held under water a little too long. <laughs> That's what Smith said. You know, waterboarding is nothing new. 
So Smith asked his superior at the CIA, he goes, well, how did we get the weapons there? <laughs> And his superior said, oh, Joe, you're too fond of black operations. Of course we didn't put the weapons there ourselves. Come on. And Smith thought that was hilarious and inaccurate. Of course, Smith would himself make a similar mistake five years later, which we'll come back to. All right. So now we're back at the White House. Okay. Helms leaves. He doesn't seem to get what he wants. Later in the day, he has this sudden desire to get an autographed photo of the president. He was meeting with Kennedy on three days before the assassination, November 19th, and he goes, oh, I don't have an autographed photo of the president. He doesn't even like the president. He can't stand his brother. He wants to get out from under. He opposes him on every single policy. But this day, he decides he wants an autographed photo. Why would that be? Well, Helms was a collector. He, he collected things like Hitler's stationery. He wrote a letter to his son on it. You know, he liked to collect things. And I think he realized that in three days, that photo would be a collector's item. And so Helms wanted a copy, and he got one. Did Helms know? All right, so that's my clue on the Kennedy assassination. On the RFK assassination, do you know that the CIA literally gave spying on Robert Kennedy in the last year of his life the same level of importance as they gave spying on the Soviet Union or China? This is in their own documents, and this was discussed in an article in the Washington Post in the 70s. All right, that's pretty sinister. Why would they fear RFK? He wasn't even, he was just a senator. What kind of a threat was he? Well, he wanted to end the war in Vietnam, and he was making some progress on that. Um, he was you know, building allies and, uh, of course, running for president on that platform. He wanted to continue the policies of JFK in the third world and treat them more as partners and not as servants to America. And, of course, uh, much less known is the fact that RFK did suspect the CIA had killed his brother and he was doing private investigations. He had different friends looking into different aspects. One friend was looking into, did the mob do it? Another friend was looking into, you know, did the Cubans do it? Did the, you know, did Castro do it? But RFK kind of came to believe that the CIA had probably killed his brother. By the way, that was his first uh, instinct. Uh, oops, I think I hit the wrong thing. How did it jump back? There we go. Um, right after the assassination, the first call Kennedy makes is to the CIA, and he asks the, the security officer there, did you guys kill my brother? That's a pretty stunning thing to think of, you know, right after your brother was killed. Obviously, there was a reason for that. All right, and who was Robert Kennedy? Again, I think this one episode demonstrates very clearly who he was and what he stood for. In June of 1965, the State Department had threatened to cut off our aid to Peru because Peru was having a dispute with the Standard Oil subsidiary there. Now, RFK was outraged to say, he said, we should be helping Peru. They need our help. You know, we shouldn't punish them just because some oil company doesn't like their policies. But Kennedy went to Peru and talked to some people there, friends of Dick Goodwin, and, uh, and they were, you know, really ragging on America, and Robert Kennedy plays the other side. He goes, well, wait a minute, you know, if it's so important to you, he goes, why don't you just go in ahead and nationalize the damn oil company? It's your country. The U.S. government isn't going to send destroyers or anything like that. And the Peruvians were stunned and said, well, David Rockefeller has just been down here, and he said there wouldn't be any aid if anyone acted against international petroleum. And Kennedy says, oh, come on, David Rockefeller isn't the government. And he added, he added we eat Rockefellers for breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, he meant the oyster, but he was no, doing no, a pun. The cover story. Yeah, the yeah. Cover <laughs> but the press know. actually misunderstood. <laughs> the press misunderstood and reported as Kennedy saying he had breakfast with the Rockefellers every morning, which is anything but the truth. But our, obviously, RFK was a little naive because <laughs> David Rockefeller ran the government a lot more than most presidents did in, in his lifetime. So, all right. So on June 5th, now we're back to Joseph Burke Holder Smith, same guy from the Venezuela episode. And on June 5th, he's teaching a class of Army officers in preparation for a joint Army uh, CI operation in Vietnam. And news comes in that Robert Kennedy has been assassinated. And his class is all happy. Upon hearing of RFK's death, the, u the unit's colonel said, congratulations, now it won't be us. You guys are great. <laughs> Only for Christ's sake, having your agent use that small caliber weapon is taking an awful chance. He's not even dead yet. And Smith, like his superior before him, said, oh, the CIA wouldn't kill Kennedy, the CIA wouldn't do such a thing. And Smith honestly believed that at the time, just as I'm sure his officer down in Venezuela probably believed the, the CIA wouldn't have planted weapons there. One part of the CIA never knows what the other part is doing, but they all want to feel they're in the know. So if they don't know, it couldn't have happened, right? And I think that's one of the reasons why people, especially in the CIA, they're either huge conspiracy theorists or they de deny all conspiracies, because if they didn't know about it, it couldn't have happened, right? So anyway, Smith in later years came to believe he had actually been wrong, and obviously the CIA was acting against Americans, and it was possible that they could have done something like this. 
But why did the colonel assume the CIA had killed Kennedy? To me, that's the interesting part. He had the context. The colonel saw what they were doing in Vietnam. He knew how the CIA operated. He, you know, this is exactly the kind of thing the CIA would do. It made total sense to him. You know, in an instant, it was all clear. He didn't need any evidence. He was just clear because he had the context. All right, now this is not a quote from Victor Marchetti. It might look that way if you're scanning this. This is actually at a forum where another CIA officer, who was also a former UPI journalist, asked this of Marchetti. He says, well, we operate in secrecy. We deal in deception and disinformation, and then we burn our files. How will historians ever be able to learn the complete truth about what we've done in these various operations, these operations that have had such a major impact on so many important events in history? And of course, there's only one answer to that. You know, you're doing it. This is how. It, we're never going to get it in the mainstream press. And there's a reason for that. It's way beyond the scope of this talk. All right, but you've got to be coming to the conferences. You have to actually read books. You will never find the truth entirely online. It's hard to get it in little snippets. You've got to read 400 page chunks to get some uh, data. So read the books, buy the books here. Um, and refuse to bow, as, as all of you do, to the continuous propaganda on these cases. I call it the largest, longest running, unsuccessful propaganda campaign in history. Because, you know, after 50 years of telling us, basically, or almost 50 years, uh, that, you know, Oswald killed Kennedy, most people still don't believe it. And that's a good sign. That should give us all hope. All right. Orwell once said, freedom is the freedom to say that 2 plus 2 equals 4. So if we want to be free, we just have to keep saying these guys were killed by conspiracy. We know this is fact. This is not theory. Like I said, who did it? You can have a theory. But the fact that it happened, not theory. And in my opinion, only the CIA has the power to have killed both leaders, to have controlled the investigations, and to have perpetuated cover-up for nearly half a decade. Individuals are dead. Organizations live on. All right. And you all for being here and your knowledge, you have the power to expose this. So thank you. <laughs>
CIA, what would have happened if they had... Um, what would have happened if... <laughs> we'll find out in a minute. The suspense! <laughs> the whole conspiracy of Dwayne Wolfer had been as competent as Cyril Webb to Bill Harper. Oh, that would have been very, very interesting. It would have still been hard to, because, you know, there's no, when the CI does an operation, there are two or three bodies removed. So, you know, would have not, immediately, suspicion may not have gone to the CI, but they might have definitely been able to convict some other people being involved. Yeah. Would have opened a huge can of worms, that's for sure. So, in other yeah. words, God really is on it. God created the West Wolf for the rest of the history. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, has, are you aware of any work being done connecting the Bush family to that network? Uh, the Whitney's and the, you know, the Harrimans and, and all of those. Right. I imagine the Russ Baker will be talking about that later today because I know he's done a lot of work on the Bush family. Yeah, I mean, again, whether it's oil or minerals or water or, you know, whatever, there's... Yeah, Bernard Bar Baruch had been Right. I mean, there's a reason we call it the establishment. They work together. They're all connected. Yes. Okay. Yes. So, uh, would you by chance happen to know where Thane Cesar is right now? I was just going to ask. Ask Dan Muldea. Last I'd heard. Yeah. Yeah. First of all, you have to pay Dan Muldea $50,000 to talk to, uh, which is interesting. It's like his Muldea's handler. Okay. Um, last I'd heard, he was in the Philippines, which is interesting because for years we had no extradition treaty with the Philippines. We do now. And uh, there's no statute of limitations on murder. Yes. Yeah. Well, I was going to say, I want to give somebody else a chance if, if there's. I was going yeah, to ask yeah. a thing, uh -huh. question also. Do you know of anybody that's done any work into him, putting him together with intelligence background? I mean, he's the obvious. You're looking at her, but it's going to be in my book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm working on something on that. Yeah. <laughs> Eddie. All right. Yeah, more thanks. More. Yeah. Can I ask one more, Lisa? Okay. Yeah, go ahead. We got um, lots of speakers. The, the question I have, real quick, is uh, if, correct me if I'm wrong. Did Robert Kennedy try to sabotage Jim Garrison's investigation? Yes or no? <coughs> and if so, why did he? I, I heard that he called Johnny Carson before right. he appeared on the show and said, don't have him on, whatever. Go ahead. Right. You heard that. Um, Walter Sheridan, who worked with Robert Kennedy, definitely tried to sabotage Garrison. Robert Kennedy, on the other hand, was not persuaded that Garrison was on the wrong track. In fact, he sent other people besides Sheridan down to talk to Garrison. He was very interested, and he told Ed Guthman, he said, I think he's on to something. All right, so it's very interesting that Sheridan, who claimed to be this great friend of Kennedy, was working very actively against him. And I will say one thing about Sheridan. Sheridan enters Robert Kennedy's life at the moment that Robert Kennedy starts pursuing uh, the, the Teamsters, the union issues, labor racketeering, and what Robert Kennedy probably didn't know at the time is that the CI was using labor unions, American and internationally, to do some of their bidding. And I think the CI was very nervous that a very good investigator like Robert Kennedy, he proved himself to be quite a good investigator in the Senate, um, I think they got very nervous what he might find, that he might find links between the unions and the CIA. I personally believe that's why Robert, I mean, uh, Sheridan, Walter Sheridan, showed up at that point in time. And I will add one other thing, and that's that Gordon Novell told me once um, when I met him, and, and Gordon Novell is one of these people that will lie at the drop of a hat, you know, but he also will tell the truth from time to time, so you never know, you know, what he's going to say. So truth or not, this is what Gordon told me, because Gordon's the one who bugged Jim Garrison's office, and he said we gave copies of the tapes to the LBJ White House, to Alan Dulles, <laughs> to the FBI, and to Walter Sheridan. And then he added, but we doctored the tapes we gave to Sheridan. <laughs> so it's possible, it's possible that Sheridan was led to believe Garrison was a lot crazier than he really was. And it's possible that Sheridan had a more innocent motive for sabotaging Sheridan. I don't personally buy that, but I put it out there. Okay. Thanks a lot. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> All right. I'll say also, I think Lisa's right about the, the resource uh, 
motive uh, on the third world. I think uh, in terms of the overall infrastructure of the Cold War uh, of the Soviet Union pitted against the United States, uh, Bobby Inman, uh, former director of CIA, admitted to me in a public forum that uh, the beginnings of the Cold War were engineered by the Galen network, Reinhard Galen, Hitler's top intelligence officer, coming over here with hundreds of Nazi spies. They were very brilliant. They basically pitted their two old enemies against each other, mm -hmm. uh, militarized and gutted the industrial base of their societies, and then demilitarized Germany and Japan and the old Axis forces and, and uh, built them up as to, to the point where those small countries were capitalist competitors with the United States. So. Um, I think on the, you know, in terms of the, the overall structure, but then in terms of the markets and access resources has always been the, the driving force, you know. I mean, just, I mean, you hear they're going to war in some country, get your atlas out and find out what the resources are there. We'll make sense of it. But um, our next speaker is um, uh, Jim Diogenio, who's worked with uh, Lisa. He did a great book, Destiny Betrayed, based on the new files that came out under the JFK Act, uh, supporting Garrison's thesis and much of what's in the, the file supports Garrison's work uh, on key issues. And um, Jim was also founder of Sitka and uh, co-founder of COPA. And uh, Chris is holding up his book. <laughs> he's, I, he's got, and um, uh, Jim is a co-editor co, uh, of Probe magazine and also of the book Assassinations. Uh, earlier and uh, currently uh, has still a website up and does great reviews of uh, all the uh, counter critics books and uh, continues to work on the case. So. And he's exasperated. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, I, 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 the mention of Jock Whitney gives me an opportunity, you know, because a lot of these idiots say that JFK was part of the establishment. You know, which he was not. But when he took office, he telegrammed Jock Whitney, who was the ambassador to England. Three line telegram Jock, Pack, Jack. Before I get started, I, I'm, I'm, I'm really happy that Andy brought John Armstrong's book here yeah. because this book. Has, nobody can find it. It's not on Amazon.com or anything. It's a very good book. I'm actually one of the few people who've read the whole thing. Like, yeah. I'm, like I'm one of the nuts who actually read Bugliosi's pile of garbage. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, but it's here. It's Ed brought up this whole mystery of the Imperial Reflex camera. You know, he only had a few seconds to go into it. It's, it's even more complex than what he said. Okay. But John lays out this whole mystery of this, <laughs> how it got there, how it wasn't there when the Dallas police inspected the house, okay, how it surfaced at the exact moment that Marina Oswald goes to Robert Oswald's, it's there <laughs> at Robert Oswald's house, okay, and that's how it gets into evidence, which she didn't recognize it at first. All right, so the preliminaries are out of the way. How did I get involved with Vincent Bugliosi in reclaiming history <laughs> to the extent that I did? You know, I really, you know, maybe people won't believe this. I did not plan it this way at all, okay? And actually, I don't like doing negative reviews, <laughs> whatever Lamar Waldron might tell you. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't like doing bad reviews of JFK books, okay? It, it, it's, it's not fun. I had a lot more fun reviewing Jim Douglas's book, okay? <laughs> you know, and, uh, and uh, Breach of Trust which is another terrific book, you know, because those are good books where, you know, you feel like you're a better person after you read them. You read Reclaiming History, you feel like a worse person, you know, at, after you read it. It's, it's, it's not a very good book. And in fact, the more I read it, the more shocked I was at just how bad it was. All right? Um, because I know Vincent Bugliosi, and I like Vince. He's a really good guy. And he's written some good books, okay? How he got involved in this one is, is, is very surprising, and it's a mystery, you know, un, unto itself, you know. But when you can write a book that's 2,646 pages long, and of the 2,646 pages, there's about 50 worth reading, you know, <laughs> something is wrong someplace, because that's a really, really, really bad ratio, all right? Uh, the other thing about this book is once... 
once you read it, and by the way, you don't have to read all that many pages to understand. Maybe you have to read maybe 300 pages to understand. There's an old lawyer's adage, which I'm sure Don will tell you better than I can. If you don't have the law on your side, you argue the facts. Okay? If you don't have the facts on your side, you argue the law. If you don't have the facts, you don't have the law, you smear your opponent. Okay? That's exactly what Bugliosi does in his book. It is, he makes Gerald Posner look like a nice guy. Okay? I mean, I never thought I would say that about anybody, but it's true. I mean, the attacks on this book, uh, they begin in the introduction. In the introduction, which, by the way, just like the rest of the book is inflated, it's like 40 pages long. Okay? It's as long as Peter Dale Scott's whole book about, what's the name of that book, the CIA, whatever it is. It's about, that's, well, his whole introduction is about as long as Peter Dale Scott's book, 56 pages. Okay? And I mean, when I say attacks, I mean, there's, there's attacks and there's attacks. Okay, Bugliosi is like, you know, like a, 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 hundred, a hundred gun battleship. All right? David Lifton, Doug Horn, Bob Groden, Jim Garrison, Oliver Stone, the early critics, and this is one of the worst parts of the book, which I'm going to get into with, with Section 8, where he actually kind of implies that the early critics were all pinkos. Okay? <laughs> Cyril Wecht, Mark Lane, and in general, in general, anybody who doesn't agree with the Warren Commission is, is, is attacked in, 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 in this book. And I mean in the most vituperative ways. All right? And of course, <laughs> whenever you do that, there's a flip side to the equation because it's a zero-sum game. Anybody who supports the Warren Commission is somehow, I mean, somehow, I mean, when you can make a case for David Bellum, something's wrong someplace, okay? But Bugliosi, er, all the way down the line, anybody who supports the Warren Commission is somehow a good guy, okay? Now, this is where the book kind of really started to shock me because when you can defend people like J. Edgar Hoover, you know, Nicholas Kotzenbach, Alan Dulles, John McCloy, and Gerald Ford, I mean, if you don't have one really bad thing to say about any of these guys, okay, I mean, it's an upside-down world. And that's the world of reclaiming it. Well, of course, you know this, don't you? You know this. According to Bugliosi, John sent me a check to be here, okay, and there's people lined up outside with $10 in their hand to pay for my autograph. Ed, you didn't give me the 10 bucks. All right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, John, I'm, I'm waiting for my check. Okay, we're, all right, but according to Bugliosi, that's why we're here. This is a circuit, you know, and I'm being paid, and people are lining up for my autograph, etc. You know, that's what he actually says in his book. All right? Now, part eight of the book, which is up, which I'm working on right now, is, I think, one of the, one of the more fascinating parts of the, se excuse me, the sections. Because I was actually thunderstruck. In part seven, I did this thing on Hoover. He does criticize Hoover. But if you read Kurt Gentry's <laughs> book, which I hope everybody does one of these days, and if you read Anthony Summers' book, there's no way not to say that, that Bugliosi does not soft pedal this guy. Okay? Because he does. He soft, and that's, of course, is because he, ha he actually says this in the book. This is one of the things that almost bowled me over, okay? There is not a scintilla of evidence to suggest that there was an FBI cover-up in the JFK case. He actually writes that in the book, okay, which is actually stunning today. Because okay, you saw Lisa's presentation, right? Okay, so I wrote, am I, well, technically, this is a correct statement. There isn't a scintilla. There's a mountain of evidence to suggest <laughs> that there was an FBI cover-up in the JFK case. Now, this is, and now this gets not only the way he handles the evidence, but the way he handles history. Because in 9, section 9, my upcoming section 9, the title of that is going to be Bugliosi versus Herodotus, or why advocates do not make good historians. Okay? Because what this guy does, this gets to what Ed was talking about. He, uh, he asks these stupid questions all the way through the book. And we're supposed to believe he's this stupid. Okay, why would J. Edgar Hoover cover up the Kennedy case? Okay, he actually asks that kind of a question. You know, and of course, if it's not in the book, you're supposed to believe that there isn't any reason for him to do it. 
So I, in my essay, I had to spell out, well, wait a minute, maybe because he hated RFK's guts, okay, and couldn't stand them? You know, so I listed all the reasons why, you know, he would go ahead and go along with it. Because this is, look, he's great buddies with LBJ, okay? RFK's already got the word out that he's dead meat once JFK gets elected. He's out of there, okay, because he's tired of dealing with them. So wouldn't he go ahead and cooperate with Johnson and the Warren Commission on this cover-up with the JFK case to preserve his own job? Especially when Johnson is a guy who actually suspended the retirement age because he was supposed to be out of there when he's 70, and he suspended that law, okay? And I, what was Hoover when he died, 72? I think he was 72 when he died, okay? So that's obvious, but he, it's not in the book, so he doesn't tell the reader any of this stuff. So, oh, geez, why would he? Why would he do it, you know? All right, when his portraits of Alan Dulles, and especially John McCloy, I mean, they have to be actually read to be believed. Okay, I mean, we're talking two of the worst people in the American 20th century. And I'm really serious about this because I thought Ellen Dulles was bad before I started doing some more work for this essay. These two guys are even worse than I thought they were. Okay, but you won't learn any of this stuff in Reclaiming History. All right, the plan of the book is pretty simple. All right, number one, you're supposed to be intimidated because it's 2,646 pages long. Nothing that big could be that bad. Wrong. Okay. All right. Uh, uh, Vince, did you ever hear of Heaven's Gate? Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. You know, the Titanic. Okay. How about the Spruce Goose? The Spruce Goose didn't fly very far, did it? Okay. You know, so bigger does not mean better. Okay. I mean, sometimes, you know, it's just worse. Okay. Because it's so long. All right. Um, the other strategy of the book, see, one of the things about Bugliosi, he loves to argue. I mean, this guy can just outlast you. I mean, this guy's an expert. The longest footnote in publication, I believe this, the longest footnote in publishing history is in Reclaiming History, where he talks about the acoustics evidence. 35 pages of footnote, a 35 page long footnote. And what he does in this, really, really, you have to read it to believe it. He admits up front that he doesn't understand the technical aspect of this evidence. Oh so, this is, so this is what he does. This is, he goes to people who he knows are going to be against it, like Bowles, whatever the guy's name, who used to be the chief of police. Okay, but that's it. Okay, all right. He goes, okay, and he loads up. Then he goes to Blakey. Goes, oh, look, this is what he says. Okay, and then Blakey gives back his answer. So then what does he do? He goes to somebody like Larry Sturdivan. Okay, this is what he says. He writes it down, and then he calls up somebody like Cornwall. Well, wait a minute. This is what this guy... And it gets into this long pig pen kind of argument. You know, like the mud wrestling. That's what it gets, like 35 pages of this stuff. Okay? What he does to Robert McClelland almost... You know, I almost wanted to go over his house and slug him. No. This, this, this dignified, quiet, neat old guy, he's literally harassing him on the phone. You know, when I interview a witness... I want to know what he knows, what he has to say, and what's his backup, okay? I don't attack him. I don't bring in contrary stuff and say, you couldn't have done that because I know this, all right? But this is what Bugliosi does. And he actually says, you couldn't have seen that hole in the back of the head because it's not in a Zapruder film. Oh, it is in a Zapruder film. Just look at Grodin's book, High Treason. He shows it, and he, it's in the second book, too. It's there. Okay, and if you look at the Z film in stereoscopy, it's very obvious there's a hole in the back of his head. But Bugliosi actually lies to this guy to try and get him to intimidate him out of his story. I got to shake this guy's hand. He didn't. Okay, McClellan would not back down from his story. Um, this is the plan, the overall plan of the book. In the, the text, all the stuff he can argue against is there. Okay, then he leaves out the stuff he can't argue against. Right. Okay, and then the stuff in the CD is the stuff where he asks the stupid questions. Okay, and he leaves it kind of up to the reader to go find the answer. And then the stuff that, it, that he just can't surmount at all is just completely gone. What he did with the FBI polygraph test of Ruby was shocking. Okay, I don't know how many people know about this test. The HSCA did not do very good work, but every once in a while, if you're very studious, you'll find a good report, like the Rose Jeremy thing, uh, the Silvio Odio thing, and the Ruby Polygraph is a good report. 
This is what the Warren Commission did. They go to the FBI to get their expert on the... <laughs> which I can just see Dulles calling up Hoover. Hey, we're going to call you for a polygraph expert. Get this guy, okay? All right, so they sent him the... This guy did the test. There's something called galvanic skin response is one of the three indicators. There's breathing, there's heart rate, and then there's the galvanic skin response, which measures if you get emotional, if you're a sensitive person, you get emotional about something, it can actually measure the emotions on your skin, the temperature of your skin. They found out that this guy, I think is Wade Bell or something, he turned down the machine at the beginning of the test to 25% of its sensitivity. And they said, wait a minute, it should have never been that low during the entire test. But this test took four hours. Okay, and they said, this is the other thing you don't want to do. Because in a long test, the indications, if you're a liar, the indications become weaker and weaker as you become accustomed to lying. Well, this is what the guy did. He turned down the GSR as the test went on. So in other words, Hoover, I mean, Ruby could have been telling complete whoppers about the third hour, and the GSR would never register it. Bugliosi doesn't tell you that, even though he read the report. The report's 21 pages long. Do you know how long Bugliosi spends on that report? <laughs> Four sentences. I even put it in my review. Believe me, I'm not lying. If you don't believe me, check it yourself. He spends four sentences on this test, all right, on the HSC. Okay. O.P. Wright's not in the book, okay? O.P. Wright's not in the book, okay? And everybody knows who this guy is, okay? O.P. Wright is a guy that Tomlinson gave the bullet to, and then O.P. Wright gives it to the Secret Service. And then O.P. Wright's not in the Warren Report, and there's no indication the Warren Report, the Warren Commission interview him. Spectre deliberately did not want to talk to this guy. Okay, and it's obvious because when Tink Thompson did talk to him in 66, he says, he gives him a picture of CE399 and says, is this the bullet that you gave the Secret Service? Says, no, that's not the bullet I gave the Secret Service. And he goes, what? And he goes, well, wait a second. What bullet did you give? And he used to be work for the Dallas Police Department. So he takes open his drawer. He pulls out a lead-colored hunting round sharp nose because this is the kind of bullet that I gave the Secret Service. And so... Thompson, even Thompson had to write, well, this kind of indicates an inside job. Somebody switched your Okay, we know that today because Elmer Lee Todd's initials, which Bugliosi says, it's almost funny, he says they're there because it's in an FBI report. He says Elmer Lee Todd's initials are on the bullet. Well, John Hunt went down to the National Archives with two magnifying glasses and he, a camera, and he took pictures of the entire circumference of CE-399. Elmer Lee Todd's are not on that bullet. So somebody switched a bullet, or there were two bullets. It's, this is completely ignored in reclaiming history, because he doesn't want to have to defend it. What he does with the Crenshaw lawsuit, I don't have enough time to go into it, but I, I, I will get into it in, in, in part nine. It's simply disgraceful, okay? He trashes Crenshaw, no doubt. Well, and he leaves out all the stuff that forced JAMA to settle. He leaves out all the evidence that Crenshaw was you know, telling the truth, okay? All right. Now, if you read closely this book, which I don't blame you for not reading it at all, okay, this is, this is, what, this is what he's saying, okay, and it, it took me a while to understand what, what this guy was selling, okay. He doesn't say anything about the exit wound being smaller than the entrance wound. I mean, Pat Spears here, he has a good illustration of this on his website, okay, but it is. So if you believe the Warren Commission, you have to believe that for the first time in history, okay, the exit wound was smaller than the entrance wound, all right? He doesn't argue that at all. All right, he goes with the Michael Bodden version of the headshot, which is up here, okay, at the, at the cowlick area, all right? Which means you have to explain, okay, why the middle of the bullet's there, okay? Because the, 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 the head and the tail were found in the car. Okay, this is something he doesn't want to explain, so he just completely ignores it. He doesn't tell the reader that magically the Walker bullet changed its size and color as Oswald fired it, okay, because Walker said when he saw that, wait, that's not the bullet I, that the police showed me that I actually had in my hand, okay? And then what he does with the tag hit, see, this is always a big problem with these guys. With Posner, remember this one? Somehow the bullet passed through the, tree, the branches of the tree, and the branches of the tree 
had the strength to peel off the copper jet. Now, if you've ever seen, if you've, if you've ever seen one of these rounds, to suggest that the twigs were going to pull the copper off the bullet, leaving the lead core, I mean, this is just absolutely ludicrous. Okay, so Bugliosi knows he can't let that one fly. Okay, so this is what he says. He says that this bullet hit the pavement at such an angle that it sheared off the entire copper jacket of the bullet and the lead core then projected over 200 feet to hit the curb next to Tag and it still had the energy to displace that concrete and bounce up and wound Tag. You know, I said it, I said it, I said in my review, this kind of reminds me of Butch Cassidy and Sundance Kid where the Sundance Kid fires a bullet and knocks the guy's holster off Okay, <laughs> with the one bullet. I mean, that's a, that. So, in other words, what you have here, what, bullet, what, what Bugliosi is selling, in my opinion, is even worse than the Warren Commission, because this guy's got four magic bullets. Okay? I mean, now, th think of the odds of this. Every bullet that Oswald <laughs> fired that year with that rifle had these magical properties. <laughs> you know, every single round. How could that, what are the odds of that happening? But Bugliosi never tells you this. So, you know, if you're, if you're an innocent bystander to this book, which I guess the best way to describe somebody who reads it, okay, <laughs> is, is that you're supposed to swallow this, you know, this impossibility. All right, now, now we have what I call the three idiots, Tom Hanks, Gary Goldsman, and Bill Paxton, were somehow impressed enough by this book to actually buy it, and now they're going to, like, force it down the American public's throat, you know, through an HBO miniseries. Okay, and by the way, and this is a book that was remaindered in less than a year. Remaindered in less than a year, and these the three idiots bought it. Okay, <laughs> you know? All right, now, here's my question. Why? Does anybody really believe that any of these three guys read this book? No. You know, no. You know, and by the way, I, I know they didn't because David McCullough, when Hanks bought the rights to the John Adams book, David McCullough said, when, I, when Tom bought the book, he flew me up to his place in Wyoming, and we sat there outside his house, and he had dog-eared parts of the book. And then he would ask me, did this really happen? Now, can anybody imagine that Tom Hanks went through 1,646 pages dog-earing it? How can you dog-ear a CD? Okay, you can't. And does anybody really believe that if he said, did this really happen, that Bugliosi is going to say no? Yeah. Okay, no, I'm lying. Okay, no. <laughs> no, uh, Alan Dulles was really a good guy. Okay, you know, was, is he really going to say this stuff? You know, of course not. All right. So, do, do these guys do these guys care about what happened? You know, I don't. I you know, I, when you make that kind of money, I get. You know, I guess you don't. And remember, this is the same team that this crazy Dan Brown fantasy, the Da Vinci Code. They took this seriously. You know, the craziest conspiracy theory you'll ever see, made by a con man, Pierre Plantard okay, in France, who actually went to jail over this, okay, and they made a movie out of it. Now they're going to take something that really was a conspiracy, and they're going to make believe it really wasn't. That, this is what I call the new Hollywood, okay, you know. So anyway, so one of the reasons I came here, I, I don't, I haven't been to one of these things in, Where God. have you been, Jim? <laughs> I haven't been to one of these things in Dallas since, I think, 1996. All right, and the last one I was at at all was a Duquesne one in 2003, okay? But one of the reasons I came this year is because I really hope that John and the other group, et cetera, re really do something about this, you know? You know, either write HBO, you know, write Tom Hanks, et cetera, or do something on their websites, et cetera. You know, I really was kind of upset that we didn't do anything for the Peter Jennings thing. I really, really wanted to do something I there. I wanted to take out, well, I wanted to take out two ads, one in Variety and one in The Hollywood Reporter. You know, why is Peter Jennings lying to the American public? Mm -hmm. If you don't burn these guys, right. they just keep on doing it, okay? So that's one of the reasons I came here, and I, I certainly hope that, uh, you know, that we do do something about this one, because it's, it's really that bad. Okay, that's it. You didn't gong me, John. You, you didn't gong me. I guess say under the time. <laughs> yeah, three minutes, three minutes for <laughs> I just have a, yeah, yeah, Just a brief comment. Um, I, uh, I, I'm not even sure how long. It was about 30 years ago. Uh, 
Mark Lane debated Bugliosi about the Kennedy assassination, and they, it was kind of a stalemate. They both, you know, had pretty good points. They were going back and forth. And then when it was over, I went up to Bugliosi, and I, ironically, because there was no John Hunt then, but I told him about the, 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 the fact that Secret Service agent Johnson and Chief of Secret Service James Riley did not initial the bullet, and therefore that the chain of transfer was broken. There's no proof in a court of law that that was the same bullet, you know. And I knew about Wright, too, and I think I may have even brought that up. And he's, at that time, 30 years ago, he's saying, oh, those kinds of things happen all the time. <laughs> right. And uh, I have blow-ups of a human-like figure with a rifle-like object on the other knoll that no one talks about. And I told him I had those. And he gave me his name and address and said, please send them to me, you know. And, um, you know, uh, you try to be open-minded. And I, you know, maybe you can convince somebody if they're honest. And of course, you know, you know, you don't know whether what their agenda is, whether they're just stupid or whether they're, they're agents or something. So uh, I took it and I went home. And the next night, in the Boston, one of the papers, the Herald of Travel or whatever, it quoted Bugliosi 30 years ago, saying, "Kennedy assassination researchers are like wolves baying at the moon." And I read that and I said, "I'm not sending this guy anything." He said that 30 years ago? 30 years ago. I, that's I, another line in his book because he says he, opened the, he started the book with an open mind. Well, <laughs> it's in the newspaper, and I still have the newspaper. I, mean, I still well, have do it. me a favor, send it to me. I'll let the finance well, yeah. Yeah. Because he prosecuted Well, that, I didn't get, I don't have enough time to go the into other, that, but he the, couldn't have been because he was a prosecutor. The other yeah. quick point is when I met him, he came to Boston. I sent you my essay yeah. on that. And he came to Boston. I wrote an essay uh, on that. And... Uh, uh, after it was over, I went up and was talking to him. He was very polite to me. And he's, I said to him, I've known Gary, I opened up with, I'm, I've known Gary Mack for 35 years. He said, I'm going to see Gary Thursday. <laughs> and then I said, I'm the main speaker in The Guilty Men. And he went, <laughs> you know. And, uh, and then I, I looked at him and I said, I'm one of the kooks. <laughs> he kept referring to him as kook. <laughs> and, and he actually said, but you're trying to find the truth, right? And I said, yes. And it was, the, the irony of it is, is that the book is so caustic in that. And he was so caustic up on the sta stage of speaking. And yet he was very polite to me on yeah. a one-on-one. On a one-on-one -on -one thing, yeah. He was yeah. very polite to me. Finally, I just want to mention, you know, he is a lawyer and a lawyer-trained mind. I, I, I taught for years propaganda and all the different fallacies and, and the specificity of each one. And, he, and lawyers in general, you opened with that, are masters of selected preference and omission of pertinent evidence. And he uses all the other fallacies consistently exactly, in right. that book. And right. finally, one last point. The greatest irony is, way back then, go look at, I think it's in Christian and Turner's book on RFK, right. and, and Bugliosi still today, he mentioned it in Boston, right. still believes in an RFK conspiracy. Right. Yeah. He does. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yes, sir. Yeah, Mark Anderson with American Free Press. I met Vincent, too, at a Massachusetts School of Law conference last year when he promoted his book on the prosecution of George W. Bush for murder. At that time, I hadn't heard of this book on Kennedy. And so I met him, had tea with him, kind of hung out with him a little. And, and I thought his book on Bush was a little argumentative, but fairly convincing about the Iraq war and all that. And then only later did I find that he wrote this impenetrable tomb on, tome on, on, on Kennedy. Yeah, wh whichever, right? And, and are you the one where there was something posted online, and I saved it in my file, where you kind of take that whole book apart and you, you talk about people that he had help him write it? Right. Did he even write this thing? When I read, when I read his other work and read this, it's, it looks ghostwritten. It looks like a compilation of kind of an intelligence uh, in lack of a better description, see, it looks like an intelligence operation to try and put the final nail in the coffin. Is see, one of the things thing. that we're never going to find out about the book yeah. is exactly how much he wrote exactly. because That's him and Dale Myers had a falling out. Yes. Okay? They had That's a right. falling out, yeah. and Myers was made to sign a settlement agreement, which he cannot talk about how much of the book is actually his. Uh -huh. Okay? Uh -huh. So this is something that I actually went after Myers on, hoping to provoke him. But I guess he likes the money too much. He doesn't want to give up the settlement. Okay, so he won't talk about exactly how much of the book is his. You know, from if you, I don't want to believe Vince wrote all that awful stuff. If you look at Meyer's website, it looks like he likes doing this kind of stuff. Okay, he likes, because he used to be a critic, and now he's against, and so he likes belittling people in any way he can. So I think he was, the other guy is a guy named Fred Haynes. Haynes died. 
Well, you know, it takes 21 years to write a book. Somebody's going to die. Yeah, right. Dale Myers. Okay, if you don't know him, you're a better human being. Okay. This was the jazz trio, huh? Yeah. Just to tie into that point, uh, do you have, through all your research on Bugliosi and his work, did you find out how much he was paid? At publishers yeah, it was a million dollars. Oh, yeah, oh. yeah, it was a million dollars up front. Yeah. For a book that was remaindered in the yes. Right, for a book that was remaindered, yeah. Thanks, Jim. Okay. <laughs> yeah, uh, Vince Bugliosi called me when he was writing the book. And yeah. And he says, John Judge, this is uh, Vincent Bugliosi. He said, you probably don't agree with me because I think Oswald acted alone. I said, no, Mr. Bugliosi, I think Oswald acted alone. I think we all do. I just don't think he shot the president. <laughs> um, and uh, he, he, even he laughed. He said, uh, I hadn't heard that one before. <laughs> but. Uh, and then, uh, much to my chagrin, he told me that I was, uh, you know, uh, he considered me one of the, uh, the real researchers who was trying to get at the truth, not like these other ones. I said, I guess he never read Judge for Yourself. I don't, <laughs> I don't know who he thought I was. 